Hi, and welcome to the Canvas Church Podcast, where you can listen to our weekly sermons. Thanks for joining us on this journey as we look to God's Word to mold us into people becoming the church. All right, well, good morning. So excited to see all of you here today. It's a super nice day out, and it's Iron Man. So, hey, give yourself a round of applause for being here. Like, come on. (laughs) No, but for real. So excited to be speaking. Uh, If we haven't met yet, my name is Adam. I have the privilege of being the youth pastor here at Canvas Church. Um, But yeah, super excited to jump into this today. As we've been doing throughout this series, we're going to read the entirety of the text right now. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Romans chapter 4. And we'll be reading the whole thing here. So 1 through 25. So Paul says this, he says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who was raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So now we're in week seven of this series through Romans. Um, We still got like a long ways to go, but we're seven weeks into this thing. And for this particular section of text, I wanted to do something we call in youth group, uh, zooming out on the text. Like kind of, we have these, these verses here, but to kind of back up a little bit 
to talk about what was going on in the historical context, like why Paul was writing these particular words to these particular people. So if you'll like nerd out with me for just, just a quick moment, I won't dwell too long on this, but for just a second here. So at this point in the early church, um, you know, we're still in the first century. Jesus, it's only been a couple decades since Jesus had been buried and rose from the dead. So the church is still very new. And at the first time ever in history, we now had Jewish believers and Gentile believers gathering in the same churches and the same temples. Now, needless to say, there was some friction there. People who had been raised with the Old Testament law, who believed and followed the law of Moses since the time they were children for generations, now with these other people who in their eyes, walking off the streets, not earning any right to be there. So there was a little bit of friction between the two. So that's why Paul writes the book of Romans. It is our most comprehensive, most detailed telling of the gospel to remind those who have followed God, known the Old Testament since childhood, and those who were new to the faith through the death and resurrection of Jesus, reminding them what was at the core, and it was Jesus. To the Jewish believer, this text is primarily written to the Jewish believer. It might seem like God was changing the game. It would seem like the church as they knew it was changing. So Paul writes these verses to remind them that God wasn't. That God was just the same as he had always been. And if you're anything like me, upon my first reading of this text, I was like, man, for being the New Testament, we're talking an awful lot about Abraham. Like Paul will just not, like every couple of verses, you run into something about Abraham. And it's like, why are we focusing so much time? So as I've studied this text and processed it, the way I could think about it, and maybe you can like, grasp onto this a little bit, is Paul is sort of using like a biblical celebrity endorsement. (laughs) Like, you know what I mean? Like Paul's like, hey, so this is Holy Spirit inspired scripture. Like I'm writing this to the church in Rome to help clarify this about Jesus. But if you don't want to take my word for it, here's Abraham. You guys know Abraham. You guys like him. Um, It's like when, I don't know, Macho Man Randy Savage did uh, Slim Jims. I think it was. I don't know. It's an old commercial. But anyway, I couldn't think of a better one off the top of my head. So. Anyway, so this is Paul's, because any Jewish person would have been well familiar with Abraham. Um, a, an analogy that I like is Abraham to a Jewish person is like George Washington to the American. Like really the first leader, right? Like it's hard to come across an American who like hates George Washington, Like you say, I don't know like a ton about George Washington, but when people start talking about him, I'm like, yeah, George Washington, first president, let's go. That was similar for Abraham. Everyone knew Abraham. Everyone loved Abraham. He was the father of Israel, appointed by God. From him would be God's chosen people. So who better to illustrate this point than Abraham? And he's using Abraham to illustrate this point. It's our one thought, our big thought of the message. Justification has always come through faith alone. Justification has always come through faith alone. And to help illustrate what that statement means, I was reminded of a story from when I was in college And just real quick, if you could just, like, raise your hand, if you just love algebra, like, if you're, okay, cool, that's more hands than I was expecting. (laughs) You can probably tell what camp I'm in on the not, not loving algebra. Mainly, it's just because I've never understood it. Like, I'm adequate at math, not like a genius at it, but I was always okay with math at school. But for some reason in high school, I really had a tough time with algebra, 
Um, and this in college was, in college algebra was the closest to ever failing a class that I ever was. I just, it's hard. So I needed a, a 70% in the class, a C minus to pass. And for some reason, every test, I kept coming up shy with like 65, 67, 69%. So the whole semester, I had a 69%. And every test, I'm like, okay, I'm going to study hard. I'm going to do this. I'm going to raise my grade just above the threshold, right? So I can just get done with this thing. But every time, I just came up shy. And so finally, it's the final. Um, we're getting ready to close this thing out, be done with this class. And I'm like, okay, I need to get at least... I don't remember, like it was a, a C of some kind on the test. And so I'm like, I'm studying hard. I'm going to do this. I take the test. I get the test back. I get a 69% on the test. But then, but then, right, bad news. But then the grades, final grades in the class are posted. And somehow I ended the class with exactly 70%. So... You probably don't want to take my word for it, like the math of that whole situation. Clearly, that's not my strongest suit. But I don't think those numbers work out. And I don't have 100% proof on this, but to this day, I swear, my teacher just like gave me a couple extra points to just kind of shoo me out of the class. <laughs> so my point is, I was given something that I did not earn, I did not deserve. The grade I earned should have kept me in that class for another semester. I might still be taking it today. <laughs> but because of the grace, because of the kindness of my professor, or maybe just irritation with a bad student, I was able, I was given a grade that I did not deserve and was able to move on from that class. And this is a concept we're all familiar, maybe not with your grades, but in some form or fashion. There are points in life where we're given something that we didn't earn, that we didn't work for, that we don't deserve. And it's a concept that we really rub up against. Like we grate against that. Here's some examples. We always deny compliments. Like someone comes up to you and they're like, hey, great job doing whatever it was you're doing. And the initial response is always, well, you didn't notice, but I messed up a couple times. Hey, like that's a great shirt. Well, my wife bought this shirt. I didn't even, like we, we deny it. We suppress the compliments. Another one is trying to give back presents. When someone tries to give you something that you didn't deserve, typically the response is, I can't accept this. We try to give it back. And I believe the reason why we do this, why we reject compliments and gifts, is because fun, it's fundamental for us. We were created to work as people. We were created to work, but we have to know there are some things that we could just never earn, we could never work for, so God gives those to us as gifts, but then we still try to like work for those gifts. God's like, no, I'm giving this to you because you could never earn it on your own. And this concept can be seen throughout the whole Bible, starting in Genesis with Abraham. Throughout history since creation, righteousness has been a gift that God has given us rather than something we work for. And that'll move us into our first point this morning. Righteousness is given, not earned. Righteousness is given, not earned. So to help uh, Paul illustrate this point, again, he uses Abraham, and he quotes directly out of Genesis chapter 15. He says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now that phrase, counted to him, is interesting in the Greek, it's a term called logizomai. And yes, I looked up the pronunciation as well to make sure I nailed it. So logizomai, it sounds Japanese to me, but anyway, it's Greek. And this is an accounting term. Like if you were an accountant, this would be a term that you were familiar with. And it means to credit someone with something that they didn't already have and they didn't earn on their own. 
And what Paul wants us to understand through this text is this righteousness that Abraham was counted with, this logizomai, is different from a wage. When you work for something, you receive a wage, right? Think about if you work, and for our purposes, let's just assume we're all in an hourly rate because that's easier for this analogy, but imagine like a paycheck at a job, right? You clock in for a 40-hour week, show up every day, work the whole time. At the end of a week, at the end of the week, you receive a paycheck. That isn't a gift. Like that isn't a present from your boss. Like that is something that is owed to you. That is your wage for the work that you have done. But think about this. Imagine you don't show up to work for a whole week, like you're on vacation or you're sick or something like that. And at the end of the week, you still receive a paycheck as if you did. Now, being the honest people we all are, I'm sure you'd go straight to your boss and say, hey, there must be some kind of mistake. I actually didn't work this week. And your boss says, I know, but I'm giving this to you anyway. That wouldn't be your due wage. That would be a gift. That would be counted to you, even though you did nothing to deserve it. That is the distinction Paul is trying to make. Our righteousness is not a paycheck. Our righteousness is not something we've clocked in for and receive at the end of the week through direct deposit. Our righteousness is something that we could never get on our own, we could never earn ourselves, but is given to us by God because he chooses to. And the same is true for every person who puts their faith in Jesus. In fact, we are counted as righteous even though we are not righteous. God calls us good even though we are not righteous good. Like it's not some magic spell happens when we decide to put our faith in Jesus. He deems us righteous and all of a sudden we like never sin again. Like all of a sudden we actually are righteous. No, God knows that throughout the rest of our lives we will never be righteous, but he calls us that anyway because of our faith in him. And several weeks ago, Pastor Nate actually explained the difference, there's these two terms. One is imparted righteousness and one is imputed righteousness. It's confusing because the words are like really similar. So I'm going to try to not mix them up. But imputed righteousness is what we're talking about here. God calls us righteous even though we are not righteous. Imparted righteousness is then what we do after our imputed righteousness to become more like him. When we put our faith in Jesus, when we say yes to Jesus, we are given imputed righteousness. We are called righteousness, although we are not. And after that, we use imparted righteousness to look more like him each and every day. But right now, we're talking about imputed righteousness. When we put our faith in Jesus, our sins are laid upon him. We are seen as blameless. And I want to say this, we aren't just seen as neutral, Like we say that we're a clean slate in God's eyes. That doesn't just make us blank to him. That doesn't mean he's just removed the bad things. But to be righteous means we aren't just seen as blank, but we're seen as good. Isn't that wild? That although I am bad, although I am evil, and I am sinful, I am wicked, I fall short of the glory of God every day of my life, God doesn't just wash me clean so I am nothing, but he instead makes me righteous. That in my place, God does not see my sin, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Nothing that I could do. Nothing that any of us could do. We could never work for our own righteousness So Jesus did the work of giving us his. And it's through knowing him. It's through believing God's promises that he has made that makes us righteous. Now to bring us into our second point. Faith is believing God. Faith is believing God. So starting in verse 13, 
Paul really gets to the heart of why anyone, like if anyone reading Romans hasn't read Genesis and you're kind of confused, like why we're talking about this Abraham guy so much, Paul actually clarifies that for us in this text, saying that he was the father of Israel, meaning the nation of Israel literally descended from this man. And it's so crazy because, and Paul actually says this, Abraham was about 100 years old, and Sarah, his wife, was not too far behind him. They had never been able to have kids their whole lives. Now they're super old, and God is like, hey, Abraham, you're not just going to have one kid. You're not just going to have two kids, but look at the stars in the sky. Those are going to be your descendants. And Sarah literally laughs in God's face, but, but they have faith. They trust in the promises of God, and actually Abraham forms the first ever covenant with God as a result of his faith. And the nation of Israel is born through him. That would take a lot of faith. That would take a lot of faith to be a hundred, never have a child, and God say, you're going to have many. It would take a lot. Because of that faith, Abraham was made righteous because he trusted the promises of God. And that's what faith is. Faith is believing God. We're used to using a phrase similar to that, believing in God. And I adjusted that phrase for a reason for our purposes because The connotation with believing in God is typically the belief of an existence of a God. You'll hear people say things like, yeah, I believe that there is a God somewhere. Like God, I mean, maybe God's in nature. Maybe God is everyone. Maybe you and I are God. I don't know. Like that's what we're, there's some kind of creator. But that doesn't take very much faith to believe that there is a God. And that brings us back to Romans chapter 1, when Paul tells us that the evidence for an intelligent creator is all around us. Like, we have trees and mountains and turn to the person next to you. Like, these are all evidences of an intelligent creator. So believing in God doesn't really take that much faith. It really just takes, like, some critical thinking. But where true faith comes in is to not only believe that there's an existence of a God, but to read what he says, to read what he has promised us, to read his commands and follow them, that is what believing God is. To trust in a God who we cannot see, who does not speak to us in a literal voice 99.999% of the time. To trust that God, that is where faith comes in. It's when we allow, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we allow God to change our actions, change our desires, the way that we live, to surrender things to him. That takes faith because that's uncomfortable. To ambiguously say, yeah, I think there's probably a God out there, but not align our lives with his vision That doesn't take much faith. But to believe the promises of God is where true faith is used. And I love the way Paul puts it in verse 17. Paul says, Abraham put his faith in God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. What better person is there to trust than that? I can't even imagine something that doesn't already exist or isn't like based on something that doesn't exist. I can't even imagine that, much less call it into existence. But our God looked at nothing and created the universe. He looked at nobody and created all of us. He created everything we see. And true faith is understanding our rightful place beneath our intelligent designer. It's knowing that the God who created the universe, who shed his blood on a cross for us, 
to, who tore the veil in the temple, who did all those things, if he can do those things, he can do all the rest of what he's promised to. The greatest miracle has already been done. He can do the rest as well. And justification through faith isn't something new. But it's what God's plan has always been. Justification through faith isn't something new, but what God's plan has always been. Now bring us into our third point this morning. God's plan has always been consistent. God's plan has always been consistent. And this point truly gets to the heart of the text. Like, this is what Paul is really trying to lock into our brains, to the original readers. And this is really why he's using Abraham. Because at this time, again, as I said at the top, Jewish believers, those who have been in the temple, in the church for a long time, likely were seeing the world and the church change around them, and were feeling very anxious about it. Feeling like the God that they had served their entire lives, that their families had served for hundreds of years, was changing the game on them. And Paul is bringing them back to reality, bringing them back to the original covenant and saying, no, God's plan has always been the same. God has not changed a bit. that we're not changing, there's a misconception that in the Old Testament, we had a works-based salvation. Like, Old Testament, and even today, we kind of have this, like, if I'm not thinking really critically, like, I can kind of fall into this belief a little bit, like, Old Testament is the works-based testament, and then the New Testament is faith. Like, Old Testament, we had Moses and the law, New Testament, we have Jesus. But really, faith has always been the name of the game. Because Abraham wasn't justified through his faith. Abraham, or excuse me, Abraham was justified by his faith. Oh my goodness. I almost lost everyone here. (laughs) Then what are we talking about? No. (laughs) Abraham wasn't justified by his works. You heard me say it. Abraham was justified by his faith. Yes. Yes. And this misunderstanding of God's plan for humanity, it wasn't left behind with first century Jewish believers. It's made our way with us today. In fact, I was uh, having coffee with a friend of mine not too long ago, and he kind of wrestles with the faith, like kind of in and out. Um, And as we're talking he just said, he's, all, he's like, I've always had a hard time with God because I feel like as I read the Bible, I see a completely different God in the Old and New Testament. I feel like in the Old Testament, I see a wrathful, works-based, like God who wants us to follow the law to a T or else he's going to zap us kind of thing. And then in the New Testament, you see the kind, loving, you-can-do-no-wrong type of God. And first of all, I think, and this is like another sermon for another day, but I think part of the problem is that we forget God's high standard even with the blood of Jesus. Like, we forget, like, Paul makes it clear, it's not that the law just, like, doesn't exist anymore. It's not like God just doesn't have Um, requirements or things that he wants us to follow, it's that none of us ever could. That is the point there. But to see a a different God between the two, and again, like, in conversations like this, you try to say what you can without just, like, throwing the whole Bible at him, but the difference between the two isn't a different God, it's his plan being acted out. It's that from the Old Testament to a New Testament, we didn't see a shift in God's character. We didn't see a shift in God's plan. We just saw another step of the plan that was created before the world was created being acted out. We just saw God's plan in action. 
We're not under a new God, but we are under a new covenant with God. That God shift, so God didn't shift his plan from a works-based to a faith-based relationship. It's always been based on faith. And what Paul is highlighting, using the story of Abraham, is that his plan has been consistent. Justification has always come through faith. And as a result, anyone with faith can be justified. Going back up a little bit to verses 9 through 12, just before this spot, Paul talks about, like, the main work, I would say, of of Jews. Like, the main thing that made them think they were up here and Gentiles were somewhere down here in the church, and that is circumcision. Paul says that word, like, a billion times in that text. And we've already talked through, like, if you've been following along with us throughout this series, we've already talked about circumcision quite a bit throughout this series, But it's worth highlighting again that this was like the the thing that made Jews think that they were in right relationship with God and no one else did and no one else could. And part of that, I mean, it's it makes sense because when Abraham goes through that covenant with God, God does tell him at that point. Anyone who is going to be in relationship with me does need to go through this ritual. So Paul is clarifying now we are under a new covenant through Jesus. It is open to Gentiles. The gospel is open to Gentiles. But what Paul highlights, and this is so cool here, is that Abraham was made righteous through his faith in God in Genesis chapter 15, and he isn't circumcised until Genesis chapter 17, which seems like only two chapters later, but in the timeline of the story, that's a period of about 14 years. So Abraham couldn't have been justified through his circumcision because he was justified almost 15 years before it happened. So that can't be the way that we're justified by God but through faith. Paul uses the guy, everyone's favorite patriarch, the father of Israel, the first person to ever be circumcised to illustrate this point that Abraham was made righteous before his circumcision. The gospel can't just be open to those who are circumcised but to anyone who claims Jesus as king. Something interesting that I read about um, the temples at this time that had both Jewish and Gentile believers, sort of the newly found ones, it would have been common practice for a Jewish person to call Abraham our father Abraham, right? He's a father of Israel. That makes sense. Our father Abraham. But the thing is, The Gentile believers, the new converts who were entering into the church, they weren't allowed to call Abraham that. They had to call Abraham your father, Abraham. That to me is pretty messed up. That to me is pretty divisive, pretty uncool. So Paul, it's so awesome, Paul intentionally in this text writing to both Jews and Gentiles, uses the phrase, our father Abraham, and then says, Abraham, the father of all. Meaning, we are all welcome to the table when it comes to God's kingdom. Meaning, it doesn't matter how you were raised, what country you came from, what rituals you've gone through, but as long as you call Jesus King and Lord, as long as you put your faith in the God who created you, who created the world, and died so you could have life, that you are justified in his sight, even though you're not righteous in practice. It is not through circumcision or any other work that earns us our righteousness, it is through faith. And where the people of Israel got it mixed up is when they were told they were God's chosen people, when they were told that they were meant to be set apart 
for the glory of God, rather than using that as a calling, they took that as a status. God's plan was not for the gospel to remain with one nation of people until the end of time, but it was for the word of God, the glory of God, to be spread worldwide to reach everyone. That's the Great Commission. Where they got it mixed up is they thought that their relationship with God was only open to physical descendants of Abraham, physical members of the nation of Israel, and did not consider those who would choose to follow God despite their nation of origin, despite their upbringing. That's where they got it wrong. It was always God's plan for the gospel to be global. It was never his plan for it to remain among one nation. I'd like to invite the worship team back up at this time. God's plan has always been consistent. And I just want to, once again, zoom out on the text just a little bit and just to look at Romans in context of the whole Bible, all 66 books, Genesis, all the way to Revelation, and just look at God's plan through the whole thing. The first sin in the Garden of Eden didn't take God by surprise. And that's something that I've had to, like, really wrestle with God about. Like, just not, like, just because I can't wrap my brain around it, but sometimes I feel like as I'm going through life, it's, we're, like, in this WWE match with, like, tights and fireworks and everything, and I'm just like, I can't understand that the first sin didn't surprise you. Second wrestling reference. This is weird, you guys. <laughs> I can't understand that the first sin didn't surprise God. It just seems because I'm surprised by everything. I'm surprised when anything doesn't go my way. But man, it was not a surprise to God. It wasn't what God wanted. It grieved his heart. Like all sin grieves his heart. God didn't want to be separated from us. But God knew when he was creating us in his image, but with free will, that there was a chance that we would decide to disobey him. And sometimes when I'm like, again, in my head, I'm not thinking super deeply or critically about the gospel. I'm like, okay, the Garden of Eden, that was a surprise to God. And then he spent the next few hundred years racking his brain. Like, okay, how are we gonna get this back on track? And I imagine like a boardroom meeting of the Godhead and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all on one of those long tables. And Jesus is like, well, I could go. I could go do it. And they're like, great idea, Jesus. And they send him. That's just my imagination. But that's kind of the way growing up, I kind of thought that that's how it went down. But when we read the text, when we hear the words of Paul, God's plan was always what it's been. We could never get in the way of God's plan. We're not that powerful. God always knew that we would turn away. So just like the first sin that severed our relationship initially in the garden, know that no individual sin could deem you unworthy or unrighteous as long as you call upon the name of Jesus. And as I begin to close out here, as I was praying, as I was, as I was preparing to, to give this message today, I just, it kept um, kind of, I kept getting stuck on the idea of things changing, but God staying the same. And I just feel like if you're in here and it feels like life is moving really fast, Maybe there's a big change coming up, positive or negative. Maybe life feels unstable. Maybe it feels a little insecure. Let God be your stability. Let God be your security. Know that since all the way back in the book of Genesis, God's plan has been consistent. He will not change the game on you. And where life feels unsteady, 
When life seems to waver, lean on him for your support. God will remain consistent even when the world is inconsistent, even when we are inconsistent. Remember that your justification, your right standing, your relationship with God isn't something that you have worked for, but it's something that's been given to you through your faith in Jesus. And that's the way it's always been. A couple of takeaways for you. The first one is, are you believing God? Or are you trying to work for your righteousness? Have faith in God's promises. If you're trying to work for your righteousness, man, that's going to be a wild goose chase. There's nothing on the end of that line. Have faith in God's promises. That when he says you are made righteous through faith, he means it. Second one, it's the one throughout our whole series. Read and process next week's text. It's so important, like, through these 40-ish minutes, like, there's a lot of ground we can cover here together, but it's nothing compared to what you could uncover in a personal study of God's Word. So as you read, just pray that God would reveal things to you. And that here, we're just kind of connecting the dots. We're gathering together, sharpening each other. But a personal reading of God's word is so important to the health of the believer. So read and process next week's text. We've all separated ourselves from God's righteousness through sin. Thankfully, This was not a surprise to him. And he's had a plan since day one to get us back on track. It's not something new, but what God has always planned for. So have faith in the promises of God. Have faith in the promises of God that you are justified through him. Would you stand to your feet as we begin to worship? I love what Shane said uh, earlier today about worshiping with a joyful heart. Man, I just encourage you, sing out, praise the God who has justified you even when you are still an enemy of God, like the Bible says. Who calls you good even when you're not good. Well, I'm going to pray. If you need prayer for something specific, we'll have some friends on either side who would love to pray with you. But Jesus, we just thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the wisdom, for the encouragement that it offers us. And God, we just pray for anyone in this gathering who has not surrendered themselves to you yet. I pray that something in them would stir, even if it's just a personal declaration from their seat, God, that they would begin to recognize the relationship, the justification that they could have in you. And God, I pray for those of us, myself included, who so often find themselves working for our own justification, making a checklist in our head of, oh shoot, I forgot to do this. Oh man, I messed up a little bit today. Well, I guess I'm a little bit less justified than I was yesterday. But God, that's not how you operate. That we are righteous because you have made us that way, not because we made ourselves that way. As we sing, God, we pray that it's worship to your ears. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. This concludes today's message. New sermon podcasts are uploaded by Tuesday of each week. We'd also love to invite you to our live gatherings each Sunday at 10 a.m. Our gatherings are also streamed live on YouTube and Facebook each week. On behalf of the Canvas Church team, we hope you have a great week, and we'll catch you next time.